This episode is brought to you by the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Workbook, the first beautifully designed, fully customizable paper charting workbook designed with you in mind. With three years worth of charting pages, the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Workbook has you covered. If you've been looking for a solid alternative to charting apps, you'll love this charting workbook. The Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Workbook is available in both Fahrenheit and Celsius editions, and it's available in spiral bound, paperback, and ebook versions. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash workbook to order your copy today. That's fertilityfriday.com slash workbook. You are officially invited. Yes, you. You're invited to join us in Fertility Awareness Mastery. This is my 10-week program designed to help you gain confidence using fertility awareness. Whether you're actively avoiding pregnancy or looking to optimize your cycles for conception, we have a spot for you. We start on October 1st. Are you ready to jump in? Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group program to reserve your spot today. That's fertilityfriday.com slash group program. This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 275. Welcome to the 275th episode of the Fertility Friday Podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. Today, I'm sharing another installment of my Fertility Awareness Reality Series. In today's episode, I am sharing my interview with Catherine, who is a member of my most recent group program. And as I alluded to in a few of the previous episodes, we get into the topic of HA, hypothalamic amenorrhea, and again, kind of talk about that connection between exercising too much, eating too little, and losing your period. And so we get into how that played out in Catherine's cycle and how she managed to overcome it. It's just a really interesting conversation. I feel a really important one. And as I mentioned and alluded to in a few of the previous episodes, this topic of losing your periods or having your periods affected by exercising a bit too much, um, not necessarily eating enough to offset that and or just the stress of the additional stress that a high degree of exercise can bring to your body is a topic that has come up quite a bit in my client work. And so it's kind of showing itself in these reality sessions. So I hope that you enjoy today's interview with Catherine. Now, if you found yourself in a similar situation, either you're struggling to bring your period back post pill, or if you have outright struggled with HA, or otherwise have just started charting and are somewhere on your charting journey and looking for support, interpreting your charts, and really delving deep into the fertility awareness method, then I would like to personally invite you to join us in Fertility Awareness Mastery. This is my 10-week group coaching program where we dive deeply into fertility awareness charting. And this program has a combination of instruction from me where we go through the specific details you need to know to chart your three main fertile signs, cervical mucus, basal body temperature, and cervical position. But the group is also comprised of what I often refer to as rotating hot seat sessions, where you have an opportunity, at least two opportunities within the group over the 10 week session to have your chart reviewed within the group. And what's really exciting about that is not only do you have the opportunity to have that one-on-one time with me, but you learn so much by seeing what happens in other women's charts, other women's cycles, different questions that come up, women who are in similar stages to you, whether you're actively avoiding pregnancy or currently trying to conceive or planning to conceive in the future. And what happens is you end up seeing scenarios that you may not be experiencing right now, things that you may face in the future. It's just a really interesting way to do it. And it really speeds up the learning curve. And so what you can expect by the end of the program is to feel completely confident in your ability to chart your cycles, to understand what's happening, to to be able to identify which days of your cycle are fertile, which days are not. If you're using the method for birth control to be completely confident in identifying, you know, when your fertile window begins and ends and to feel really comfortable and confident relying in fertility awareness as your primary method of birth control. But also if you're trying to conceive or planning to conceive in the future, this program will help you to identify what you can learn about your overall health and fertility from charting and will give you that specific information you need to move forward. 
And so make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group program for additional details. And of course, to reserve your spot, we start on October 1st and that date is going to come <laughs> much sooner than you think. So head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group program to reserve your spot today. Now, without further ado, let's jump into today's episode. Well, I'm really excited to be here tonight with Catherine. She's a member of my most recent Fertility Awareness Mastery program. And as we're recording this, we're actually right before our last session. So Catherine and I have now been together for at least two and a half months. And so we've gotten to know each other a little bit. And I always love doing these sessions because it gives me an opportunity to ask certain questions that I don't necessarily ask in the session because it's a little bit, you know, because in the session, it's all chart, cycle, all of the things. So welcome to the show, Catherine. I'm excited to have you here. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Well, so I like to always just jump in and start with a bit of background to help the listeners to kind of connect to you. So I'd love for you to share just a little bit about, you know, when you, what your cycles were like after you had your first period. And then if you ever used the pill, kind of what your experience was with managing your fertility and things like that. And what brought you to this point where you decided to jump into the class and learn about fertility awareness? Okay, cool. Well, I... I experienced my first menstruation when I was 14 and most of my, well, I really didn't have any like sex ed from my parents, which was really sad for me because I had heard that like other girls, like my cousin, she had a special book, you know, that like explained body changes and stuff. And I was like, that'd be so cool. And for whatever reason, my, like, I never, I never received that. And so that just always has been kind of in the back of my mind. Like there's something that I don't know that I wish I did know. And for whatever reason, it's taken me like, I think I'm 27 now. So it's taken me like 13 years, you know, to get to the point where I was like, I found you and your fertility awareness masterclass. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this is like, this is like my dream come true. (laughs) So my periods, they were pretty, pretty painful in high school. Like just as just like the cramping. And then sometimes I felt like I was kind of debilitated. Like I had to just like stay at home and like put pillows under my body and stuff like that to like be comfortable. And I would be like, you know, grimacing in pain. (laughs) Oh my gosh. It's so difficult sometimes. But then when I moved to college, I moved, gosh, well, I grew up in, you know, Southern California and I moved to Eastern Washington. So I was really far from my family and I started exercising a lot and I have, my diet was totally different because I was eating the food at the cafeteria. And for whatever reason, I just kind of stopped eating fats. Like I started drinking like low fat milk, which I wasn't raised on. And I started eating like a lot of, I would just have like salads and a lot of kind of like vegan food. And I really didn't know too much about diet and how it was like related to the body. Well, what I thought was like the more vegetables you eat, the healthier you are. <laughs> so I so I stopped menstruating like my second month into college and I didn't menstruate for like, I don't know, like 12 months, like about a year. And after about 10 months, I was starting to think like this, this isn't right. Like I should be menstruating. So I went to the clinic at the school and the nurse said that like my blood results, you know, were fine and I was super healthy. Um, she just made it seem like a non-problem that I was not menstruating, but it was still really bothering me. And so then when I went home over the summer, my mom took me to like a hormone doctor and the hormone doctor said all of my hormones were like the levels were fine. 
And so she just recommended that I try taking some sort of like birth control pill to start menstruating again. And I really was like, I was like, was really not into like taking anything like in a pill form, like Tylenol, much less like birth control. But I really did feel like desperate. And like, I felt like there was something like wrong with me, you know, and I just wanted it to be right. And so I was like, okay, I guess I'll try it. So then I, when I got back to college, I started, I went to Planned Parenthood and got this, this pill. I don't even know what it was called at this point or anything. And I took it for like three months and my periods did come back, (laughs) but they were pretty horrendous. Like they were, it was like way more blood than I had had in my previous periods. And my boobs grew a ton. Like they were super tender. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so weird. I felt like a Tyson chicken or something. (laughs) Like I felt like a chicken that had been injected with hormones or something to like grow bigger. It was really, it was really weird. And my mood swings were pretty intense. So then I stopped like after three months. Well, I know there's some listeners that are like, they want, they're going to want me to, to kind of say that because it's so interesting when I I hear stories like yours, Catherine, Mm -hmm. where it's like, first of all, all hormone levels are totally fine, which is ironic because when you're not ovulating, you're not making your natural estrogen to the the level that you should be and you're not making significant amounts of progesterone as you should be in the second half of your cycle so it's very interesting Mm -hmm. to me to hear like that you were repeatedly told that all quote-unquote of your hormones were totally normal because you can't make progesterone unless you ovulate in significant quantities so it's interesting for me to hear that and like process it but then also like again the same language of like well it's okay if you're not menstruating we'll just put you on the pill so that you'll menstruate and kind of the language was like my periods came back on the pill and I was menstruating again, which if you're on the pill, it's not menstruation it, because in order to menstruate, you have to mm-hmm. ovulate. So really, you know, it's, mm. it's, it's so interesting how oh. we talk about these things and how even to yeah. this day, like the medical field is kind of cavalier about it. Because when, in your case, you mentioned that you changed your diet, you were exercising a lot. Yeah. And you stopped menstruating and you mentioned that it was gone for 12 months. And yeah. what the research tells us is the longer that you go without a period, the more the increased bone mass that you lose and it puts oh, you, right. yeah. So it's a, it's a big deal. So it's just, I'm just kind of calling out, I suppose, <laughs> like, healthcare is just, just like, no, 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 no it, it's not okay for a woman to <laughs> not menstruate. And when you're on the pill, then it slows the bone loss but the bone loss still continues until you actually like resume cycling naturally okay so that was just a little (laughs) because I know there's listeners that are like no no Lisa (laughs) yeah (laughs) (laughs) gotta say something (laughs) yeah Um, wow but but okay so back to see you were you took it you said you took it for three months and you you did especially because in your case it, it sounds like you hadn't was this the first time that you had taken the pill kind of ever yeah, exactly. And since then, it's the only time that I've taken like the pill. Because in your case then, because you were already in college, so you were essentially a grown woman, you were an adult, you had been in your body for all this time, and you had previously experienced natural cycling for years. Right. So then going on the pill for you felt different like, somehow. Yeah, so I had been naturally cycling for like I want to say like three years or four years. So yeah, it did feel different. And what you just explained, I feel like you just like put words to all the the feelings that I had around that time and questions, you know, about like, this doesn't feel right and that stuff. Just wanted to say thank you for that. (laughs) Well, you're welcome. And to speak a little bit more into that, as Mm -hmm. women, we we do have this intuitive sense, this little tiny voice inside that, that says like the protests and says, this isn't right. This isn't okay. And it comes up in, I mean, in my line of work, it comes up in different scenarios. So sometimes it can be that you have some sort of health issue that you can't really put your finger on, but you've, you know, something isn't right. And you know that, but you continue to be Mm -hmm. kind of dismissed in your case, 
the fact that you weren't menstruating and you did feel like something was wrong, even though the health, because you went to several health professionals and the, the, the kind of, you know, yeah. dismissing that and it's not a problem. So I just wanted to speak to that because as women, it's very common for us to ignore that little voice inside, the little voice that protests and says, wait a minute, there's, this mm-hmm. doesn't feel right. There's something wrong here. But you somehow, even though you were being continually being told that, somehow that voice still persisted. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. So then what happened next? So you were on the pill for three months. You were like, this doesn't feel right. You mentioned you felt like a a turkey or chicken or something (laughs) that was like ejected with hormones. So it wasn't working for you. And so then what happened then when you came off of it? Well, let's see. So I had also gained a lot of weight on the birth control. But, and at this point, I don't know, it could have just been because I, I had, I stopped. Oh, that's another thing. So when I spoke to the, the two healthcare professionals, they, they both told me they were both women and they both told me like suggested that I stop exercising as much. And so at first I like cut, cut it down. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not gaining weight. Like nothing's happening. Like, I think I was like a hundred pounds at that point. And I'm like five, 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 six or something. That was pretty, pretty bony, you know, not too much fat there. And can you tell us how much you were like typical week, how much you were exercising? Gosh, I would run like many miles every week. Like I don't, I was like really into running and then I would also like go to the gym and do like cycling on the bike. So it was mostly car, like that type of running or cycling. Probably, I would say like four times, at least four times a week. Yeah. And I also wasn't like eating nearly as much as I had before. So I think I was like probably around like 124, 126 pounds, like when I first went to college. And then Maybe like, you know, I started this new lifestyle and then I lost like, you know, those 25 pounds or something. So, okay. So then these women, these healthcare professionals, they said, why don't you try to like stop exercising as much? I was like, yeah, maybe you're right. So I cut it back and things weren't progressing like fast enough. And at that point I, I didn't have like, I wasn't, you know, checking in with these healthcare professionals like on a weekly basis or anything I was kind of on my own so I was like oh this isn't happening fast enough I'm just gonna stop exercising altogether (laughs) and so then I started totally unhealthy like you know equally unhealthy I started like binge eating and I, I also didn't really know how to like you know deal with my emotions around that or anything so I gained a lot of weight during that time when I was it was probably about six months. I was trying to figure out what was going on. And then I was on birth control. So by the time I came off of birth control, I was just like totally miserable. Like my boobs were huge. Like, you know, I just had just gained weight that I was not comfortable with. And I felt like inflamed and just unhealthy. And so I decided to start running again. So I started running again. And I think I had like one, one cycle before I stopped cycling again for a while. And so it's, and so since I was like, you know, for the past, okay, I'm 27 now. So I want to say like, you know, for the past seven years, I've been cycling, like my cycles have been irregular. You know, I don't know. Do you call that like dysmenorrhea or amenorrhea? Um, Well, dysmenorrhea is when you have the pain. Amen. Okay. I think is the word you're looking for. I mean, okay. Catherine, what you described, it falls, it sounds like anyways, because it kind of, it hits a lot of the points that stand out with hypothalamic amenorrhea. Um, oh, interesting. So, yeah. Women who lose their periods and it, when it falls under the category of hypothalamic amenorrhea, it's typically a combination of over-exercise, undernutrition, and stress. Mm. 
Yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we hit all three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and sure. there's a pattern. And so uh, one of the things I often say is, I mean, you probably didn't, I don't know, maybe you did, but did you consider yourself to be an athlete or did you, were you just running because you loved it? No, I did it mostly to like cope with the stress, I think. Yeah. So I didn't even realize like I did do occasional like runs and stuff, but I wasn't really like, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, I just say that because typically you wouldn't think of yourself as an athlete just because you exercise, right. but at the level that you describe when you're running miles a week, at least you said four times a week, meaning that probably yeah. on a, there were many weeks that was more than that or possibly even like a run yeah. in the morning and a gym in the afternoon. Yeah. That. Yeah. Right. So you don't necessarily right. think of it. And the other thing, it's very easy to under eat. So I think a lot of us don't realize <laughs> it's like a genuine mistake. But for instance, like if you're living your life and you're eating like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you don't necessarily think that if you're literally running several miles in the morning and then going to the gym and spinning at night, that you may need an extra meal to account for the energy that you have expended during your exercise routine, let alone the, the combined additional food that you would be like, you would need to consume to, to actually offset the energy expenditure throughout the whole week. Wow. It's just not something that comes to mind. Yeah. <laughs> Especially no. it seems like, and it's a pattern. It seems like a lot of women fall into this pattern. And then if you don't, if you don't have the awareness that your menstrual cycle, so this is one of the, with hypothalamic amenorrhea, HA, it's one of the classic examples of why we should consider the menstrual cycle a vital sign. Yeah, right. Because your menstrual cycle is very sensitive to this combination of stress, over exercise and under nutrition. And so for some women, they wouldn't necessarily lose their period entirely. Some women just their luteal phase gets really short or they have some mm -hmm. spotting before their period, but others, depending on the level of exercise and stress and the combo, they lose their periods entirely. And so if you don't know that your period is kind of like, it's basically like the fire alarm that's going off mm -hmm. in your house that's on fire. If you don't know that, then like in your case, there's nothing to, but your body's basically like, so screaming when, when you look at the research about HA, your body stops. So basically like the connect, the, the connect, the conversation that's supposed to be happening between your ovaries and your pituitary stops happening because your body is actively trying to conserve energy. Wow. And because you're undernourished it's almost, that's why the bone loss, because your body's literally trying to get the energy from anywhere. Oh my God. Just to like, yeah. So it's important. This is important stuff to be aware of. And one of the things that we didn't mention yet on the call is that you are actually, how pregnant are you? <laughs> how many months are you? <laughs> how many months? How many months? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I was like 100% pregnant. <laughs> I'm, uh, I think I'm like 20 weeks now. Yeah, very pregnant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. but what you mentioned was that from, for the past, you said, I think seven years, then your cycles mm -hmm. were irregular. And that's what brought us to this HA conversation. But basically for the past seven years, you would get periods, but it sounds like it wasn't all the time or consistent. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then one of the challenges in in your case, and this is in your case, baby number three? Yeah, this is pregnancy. It's pregnancy number three or number four, pregnancy number four. The first, my first pregnancy, I didn't carry to term. It was terminated at 10 weeks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, because one of the challenges, I suppose, just in general for you yeah. after baby number three and after you kind of get back into the groove and all of those things would mm -hmm. be to to, to, to kind of sit with everything that we've spoken about today, because it sounds mm -hmm. as though you never had the opportunity to really get a handle on yeah. all of that. Yeah, you're totally right. And so, it, so, for example, I don't think that it means that, so if, I don't think it means that you 
like you can't exercise because for instance there was one study that I was looking at when I was writing the fifth vital sign and they they did have women who were exercising a lot I don't remember if the women were specifically athletes but these women were trained I think they were athletes because they were training I think an Mm. average of six days a week and they would have one day off and so there was a number of the women who you know had been amenorrheic uh, the ones that hadn't got their period back they they're basically what they did is they would give these women a high caloric nutritional beverage in addition to their meals so these women would have their meals their regular meals and their the regular life but after they would complete their workouts they they would drink this you know high caloric uh, nutritional beverage that contained a combination of protein fat and carbohydrates so Mm. essentially like an additional caloric meal meal Mm. a day Mm. and then on their So they would drink that each day after their training. And then on the seventh, kind of their day off, they would also drink the beverage type of thing. Mm. And it was interesting because all of the women got their period back at some point. The ones who had been amenorrheic for the longest, it took them longer, Mm. but they still got it back. So it was, it was an interesting study because they were kind of testing that theory that like, what if, if, if it is related to this combination of, you know, energetic deficiency, yeah. Um, then what would happen if we actually just gave them more <laughs> food? Yeah. Food. <laughs> yeah. Every day. But I think that for the average woman, I don't know how realistic that is because women who are struggling with the issue of HA losing their periods, yeah. not, it often does need to involve reducing or stopping the exercise, even just for a period of time. And then. Sure actually working on making sure that you are eating enough food and hitting yeah. the protein, the fat and the carbs in each meal. Yeah. Um, so, so that would just, and, and now that you, so you have, what's interesting, obviously in, in your case in the group is that you've, you've, you're pregnant. So there's not like a lot of like, you've have been charting, right. But it's not the same. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But when you are postpartum and you're charting again and you kind of get into the Mm -hmm. groove, once you start cycling again, whenever that happens, Mm -hmm. then you'll have this initial knowledge, you know, of what's supposed to happen. So then you can finally get into that place of using (sighs) the cycle to kind of gauge where you're at. Yeah. That's yeah. I'm so psyched for that. Like I, I was, you know, before I signed up for this class, I was, I was when asking myself this question, you know, like, well, I am pregnant already. So, well, you know, when I take this course, I'm going to be pregnant. I won't be able to practice charting, you know? And I spoke to a couple people about it and some of them were kind of, you know, also wondering if I would really benefit from participating in this class. But I really felt like, you know, if I don't do it now, like, it's kind of like now or never. And you just, you kind of have to just, I felt like I just wanted to grab the bull by the horns, especially since I'd spent so many years, like, being in the dark about my, my, my fertility, you know, and my cycles. And now after, yeah, like you had mentioned, we're almost done with this class. So after going through, you know, all these weeks, I feel like I have gained so much knowledge and insight and I am like so excited and I feel just, you know, way more supported, you know, even though, I mean, you know, I won't be like speaking to you or these women on a weekly basis, you know, after the class, but just knowing that there are other women out there who are interested in this, you know, lifestyle and who also want to like appreciate their fertility or their cycles. I'm just like, okay, yeah, I'm not alone. And that's, feels really amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I appreciate you saying that. And I mean, with, with you being in the course, you obviously were actively participating and we spoke a lot about using the method for birth control postpartum and kind of Mm -hmm. setting you up with, the kind of the mindset and it I I know that it also helps to be in the group with multiple women at different stages because you've benefited from seeing charts there's women who are actively using the cycle or using the method now and they're cycling so you're 
to kind of see all of these different iterations of what's happening. But I, I got the sense from you that you were, you, like you were on top of it and you always had lots of, of questions very specific <laughs> to how you want to use this method postpartum, which is, which is part of the reason why you benefited so much from it because you were actively like hungry for the knowledge. <laughs> Give it to me. Yeah. Hey, well. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks for sharing that, you know, that feedback. <laughs> yeah. Well, and thank you for sharing your, just your experience. And I can see after having this conversation with you and actually going through your history, why this is so important to you now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can switch gears and go into our session portion of the call. So as I mentioned already, we spoke on about, you know, several different topics throughout our, our different hot seats together and our private call outside of this very public private call. <laughs> <laughs> but did you I just have a sense of what were your kind of biggest questions today? What was at the top of your mind? And what did you want to make sure that we focused on? Well, you know, honestly, now that you and I've had this conversation, I'm just really curious about the bone loss that you just mentioned. I feel like a lot of the questions that I've, that I've had have been answered. And if there are any that come to my mind, I'll definitely ask you, but I'm just, because this is actually a question that I've had, like regarding studies that I read about how caffeine leaches calcium from your body and whatnot. And so when you just mentioned this about, you know, bone loss being like kind of a, a symptom or a side effect or something of hypothalamic amenorrhea. I'm just wondering if there's any way that I could like build my bones up again. <laughs> um, well, I mean, the research when you once you have resumed healthy cycling, essentially once you are out of because your body is kind of in a state of emergency, really. And so mm -hmm. once you're no longer in that state, then the bone mass or the bone loss does like slow down or stop. The question of, you know, will you rebuild how, you know, depending on how long. So there are studies that show that depending on how long this continues. Mm -hmm. So as women, we gradually build bone to what they call our peak bone mass. And mm. so the, the most bone you'll ever have in your life. And peak but we hit peak bone mass I believe somewhere between age 30 and 40 there was a study that I was looking at that you know so we you know and so yeah okay so the like so the question of like what can you do to restore I think the most important thing in general is to make sure that you're consuming enough food to offset the caloric deficit so that's mm -hmm. like step one <laughs> yeah okay so now that you're pregnant, I'm just curious. So prior to pregnancy, prior to pregnancy, you were still kind of postpartum with baby number two to, to some. Yeah. I don't remember how much spacing was in between baby number two, but. Mm -hmm. Between my first two babies, there was about 10 months and then between nine or maybe nine, nine or 10 months. And then between my second and third babies, there was about like. 10 or 11 months does that make sense like yeah. difference yeah okay yeah. cool um, so yeah probably. well and so during this time when you have now been pregnant and you know breastfeeding is it a different time for you because I mean I would imagine that the exercise routine had to be had to be changed so maybe how mm -hmm. was the exercise routine like prior to the the mommyhood phase and then how has mm -hmm. it how has it been kind of like what is it like now are you still exercising now you know a bit less or does it look different mm -hmm. sure yes I definitely do not exercise near what I exercised that first year of college um I prior to getting pregnant with my third my first baby yeah my first baby my husband and I would go on like 20 minute runs, maybe like three mornings a week, maybe like two or three mornings a week. But we definitely at this point, like four years later, or three years later, I definitely do not do that anymore. And I, I pretty much stopped once I got pregnant. I now what I do is like I go for walks a lot of times, like pushing the stroller with my two children. 
Sometimes I will do like an epic bike ride to the farmer's market, which is like six miles. And that's, I can feel that like my muscles are working, you know, cause they're not used to it, but maybe, you know, that's like occasionally like once a month, maybe. Yeah. I'm, I feel like I do a lot of running around just with my kids, like literally just chasing them and, and also playing with them. And then I also, I was pretty good for a couple months and then I kind of fell off of that habit, but sometimes I'll like get up in the morning and do like 10 minutes of yoga, just like stretching, not like hot yoga or anything intense, just mostly like breath awareness and stretching and sometimes in the evening, but that's pretty much where it's at now, my exercise. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's something just to be, I, I would say that would be something to be cognizant of as in the postpartum. I mean, it's, it's challenging enough with two, you're about to, to be a family five. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so honestly, when you are running after children and things like that, they are the priority. So they always eat, <laughs> but mommy doesn't know. Yeah. So, totally. so this would be your question about what can I do? I mean, Certainly mm -hmm. one of the things you can do when you are in the headspace and when you're, if you're, if you're wanting to just, you know, pursue it, you can certainly make an appointment with your doctor and have this conversation about your concerns regarding possible bone loss and things like that and see if there's any oh, okay. testing. Like you could certainly, it's, it's not a bad idea. I mean, when you have health concerns yeah. just to kind of, you know, and it, to, just to see if there's any testing that can be done, you know, to determine yeah. if, if that affected you and how much that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So to get more kind of consistent answers or specific answers, but in terms of what you could do, given what we've talked about today, like the most important thing is to make sure that you're getting enough to eat so that mm -hmm. you're, you don't inadvertently put your body back into that state. Gotcha. We wanna like, yep. first of all, like you've got the bucket with the hole in it. So we got to plug the hole, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, stop the loss. That's step yeah. one. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> And again, easier said than done. So, you know, I recently did a podcast interview with Mega Mama Kimberly Ann Johnson, and she talked about the fourth trimester and just the concept. And it's harder for you because you've got so much going on. Right. Um, but the concept of what can you do to build in a period of time where you are essentially not required to do all of the things post baby mm -hmm. and can you prepare meals in advance do you have a support system friends families family who can arrange a meal train so that we can at least make sure that you are actually eating you know sufficient amounts of food <laughs> three square meals right. a day um, yeah for this because you you know when third be and it's you know as a mom already you kind of know you've been through this twice you know what's coming but at the same time we overestimate what we can do in every situation <laughs> you're right as related to babies because you've already done it twice so you kind of like you know but got it. Time, mm -hmm. yeah but no like I feel yeah, like I gotta be the mama hen right now like no you don't <laughs> <laughs> You don't got it. <laughs> well, right. I mean, you do, but you do know it's different. It's right. different bringing a baby into the chaos than like the first baby <laughs> into no chaos. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so these are important things to think about your 20 weeks. So you're almost at the, well, you're not quite at the like nesting stage. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It's but, totally true. The nesting thing is real. <laughs> yeah. Cause you're not really worried yet. You're kind of like, whatever, but yeah. within when you hit the third trimester, but those are things to think about. Can you mm -hmm. get some food in your freezer? What can we do? Right. There's an episode that is coming out. So by the time we release this, it'll have been released, but it's not, as we record this, it's not released, but the episode with Adriana Lozada. And in that episode, she gave this amazing analogy that I really, really liked. And then I think you'll appreciate as well. So she basically said, imagine if you were on vacation, even though you're in your house. So if you were in, on vacation, you wouldn't be doing laundry and you wouldn't be cooking food and you wouldn't be doing all of the things because you're on vacation. Someone else would be doing that. And right. so it was basically like, how could you arrange that in your house for at least the first month or even the first week, but how could you 
arrange that. So two really great episodes to kind of like when you're ready, because it's like the the most important thing you got to, it's all of the analogies. I'm always full of analogies. Yeah. Self and just make sure the kids are okay, but you really got to make sure that, yeah. So priority number one, get enough to eat. And then of course you can incorporate, you know, bone broths, foods that are going to support just in general, your development, and then once you're, we mentioned this as well, but once you're back into cycling, then now you have the knowledge and information that you didn't have when you were in your early 20s. So now you know that if you're a cycle stop again, and it doesn't, right. it doesn't mean no exercise. It means that you're in a conversation with your body to figure out how to do the dance, how to do your exercise, how to make sure you're getting enough food so that your periods stay. And the minute that they stop yeah. coming, it means you have to readjust. Yeah. That's really nice that like dance dancing with my body. Yeah. That's a nice way of like looking at it, you know. Yeah. Well, cuz that's what it is. Uh mm-hmm. it's interesting cuz you wouldn't I think a lot of us underestimate how sensitive our bodies are to these things, but when you mm-hmm. can see it in your charts, it becomes quite clear that uh, Yeah, and then one of the things that you mentioned that I think I should just point out, because you mentioned there was a lot of stress, and that's why you were exercising a lot, to help you handle the stress. We don't think of exercise as stress, though. Like, you're you're doing the exercise to get rid of stress, but the exercise itself can become a stressor. It's stressful. Yeah. Especially when you're doing steady state. So when you're doing, like, like the running and the cycling, because it's the same level for half an hour all the time or an hour or whatever as opposed to doing like right. high intensity where you're doing like short bursts of high energy it actually mm. changes the way that our hormones are produced and so when wow. you're doing the steady state all the time over long periods of time it can increase your cortisol levels like it can be like a stressor on the body yeah and Gosh, if you've ever heard that example of like a woman who's trying to lose weight and so she does the steady state activity all the time and so initially she loses weight but eventually she starts gaining it back yeah right yeah (laughs) oh gosh there's so much thank you you're such a wealth of knowledge (laughs) i've done a lot of interviews so the interview i would suggest is i'll have to like in the show notes for the listeners there'll be a lot of like i'll list all these things but i did an interview it was an episode, episode 124, and it was a split interview. So I interviewed Dr. David Brownstein, and he talked about thyroid. And then I interviewed Dr. David Wilson, who mm-hmm. has, he was talking about some incredible research about weight loss. I, I did this interview in person, so I actually went to this conference, and both of these incredible wealths of knowledge, <laughs> these men, these, Brown, Dr. Brownstein is a medical doctor, and Dr. Wilson, I think he's a... I don't remember if he's a medical doctor or a naturopathic doctor, but he's a doctor. Um, Mm -hmm. But he was talking specifically about weight loss and how the type of activity can dramatically impact that and how it can impact your hormones and all these things. So it, and then he talked about the issue of how it can over time increase the cortisol levels and actually essentially be like a stressor on your body. So I hear that a lot. I've spoken to a lot. Like, so Catherine, you're in good company. <laughs> There's a yeah. lot of women that fall into this category. You are not alone. There are, you know, hundreds of good. women yeah. who are identifying with this right now. Yeah. Well, it is what it is. Right. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. But the, the, just the, the concept of like, I'm really stressed and exercise because that's what our culture tells us to do, but we don't think of yeah. exercise as stress. Totally. Right. And there this is go. not an anti-exercise. This is more of like no. yeah, the sure. amount and the, the kind yeah. Yeah. And I like, since that, since that, you know, year of my life, it was essentially a year where I, where I was doing that really intense exercise. I have learned, I have also learned like what you're saying that there are just so many different ways to deal with stress. You know, like sometimes, sometimes just like talking to a friend who is a really good listener, just, it makes such a world of difference, you know, or or sometimes it's, it's actually like, you know, talking about food, like eating something and um, like, I'm just like, oh, I guess I was just hungry, you know, or saying no, you know, learning how to say no. I feel like it's just like, you know, like stress can be like an opportunity for learning some life lessons. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, and as we bring our session to a close tonight, I know, so for the listeners, like you and I have had multiple opportunities to talk, to really hash out the method itself and to talk about right. how to plan for postpartum with charting. And in our yeah. most recent call together, we spent a lot of time. Actually, yeah, we, we had our hot seat in the last in the last session, which was just a couple of days ago, like from when we were recording this and we spent our yeah. session talking about how to manage the fertile window and the different, the different methods of birth, like non-hormonal birth control. And so we've, mm -hmm. so that there's like some background, we've talked a lot about the practical aspects of it. So I think that's why our conversation today just went in a different direction, which I think is really important. I'm really glad that we had this, this conversation. Yeah. Oh my gosh, me too. And I, I mean, I totally, I, I mean, I definitely feel like I'm going to need some, like, some additional support either, you know, from you or through the different programs you offer once I am postpartum, just because I do have a lot of, you know, knowledge now, but I think it will be different once I'm actually practicing. I think that I will run into some questions and be like, oh, this sounds familiar, but I, you know, kind of want to clarify. <laughs> I don't want to get pregnant again too soon. So, yeah, I just, I just want to say thank you again. <laughs> oh, well, you're welcome. Well, and that's, I mean, I've had a number of clients who have, you know, after when they're ready. So whether it's like three months after baby or six months after baby, but basically just like a, a, a session or two to touch base, just like, mm -hmm. okay, <laughs> right. it's, a bit, it's a bit different. We've talked about that, but it does come back. So that's the good thing. Like. Cool. So, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, so as we wrap up, I always like to ask my reality series ladies who've been in my mm -hmm. programs for the listener who is kind of thinking about coming off the pill and contemplating fertility awareness, but is terrified because I think it's really common to be just, we've been, we've been given this education as women or this miseducation. A lot of us are just, I mean, I, I was terrified of getting pregnant because I thought I could get pregnant all the time. And so a lot of us fall into this just sheer terror at the thought of even, even totally. thinking about coming off the pill. So for anyone who's in that situation, what advice, if any, would you want to give to her? Um, I would say that you as an instructor are pretty conservative I, I like, I, I would just say very conservative in your, how I, let's see if I can word this in, in your like approach to the transition. Like I, you know, you've mentioned various times that we, we should not use this technique as like as birth control until we have cycled, you know, multiple times with it. And like, we've like kind of reached these like check marks. So I feel like you as an instructor have really helped me at least. And I'm sure other people just kind of like outline it very clearly. Like the, this is kind of like a transition plan. So like just in case, like you're saying, in case somebody is like freaked out about getting pregnant, you know, you can still practice this technique and learn about this technique while you're on birth control, even, you know, like you don't have to like do anything before you're ready to. Does that make sense? It does. I think that that's something that's really helpful to remember and kind of like, it kind of can relax the mind a little bit that um, mm -hmm. it might seem counterintuitive, but you can start just getting right. in the habit of checking for your mucus, even though you won't really see any, but you can still get into the habit of doing that. <laughs> but it's important right. to say, but it's, but it's, it's not yeah, silly. Totally. It's helpful to kind of get into the habit and you can take your temperature. Like you can kind of just do it for a couple of weeks or something like that to just help to get yourself in the habit as a way of easing yourself into it before you actually go off. And then during that time right. when you would be doing those things, actively educate yourself about it you know get tony weschler's yeah. taking charge of your fertility grab a copy of the fifth vital sign and just start really educating yourself about it 
Yeah. So one final question for you then mm-hmm. for the listener who has heard about the, you know, fertility risk mastery program is thinking about, you know, should I join it? Should I not? What's it like? Is it weird to be talking about cervical mucus in a room full of other women? <laughs> what would you want them to know about the program? I mean, I would just definitely do it. Like maybe just like sit down and like work out any fears you have about why you wouldn't take the class. Because if you have been, you know, following Lisa's, I don't know, you know, all of any or all of her educational offerings, then there's something intriguing, you know, to you. And there's a reason why it's intriguing. There's a reason why you're listening and wanting to know more. And so if you have that kind of seed that says like, maybe I could take this class, I would say that's like a beautiful seed that you can continue to water and like I think only only good things you know can come from that that's I think what I would say and personally it's been an amazing class it's been just like maybe like 500 times more amazing than I thought it would be like honestly (laughs) so that's just a personal you know from my personal standpoint well thank you Catherine yeah that's mm-hmm. awesome. Well, thank you for being here, for spending some time with us, for sharing so openly about your experience. And we all wish you the very best. By the time this episode comes out, you'll yeah. probably have a baby <laughs> <laughs> or be very yeah. close to having a baby. Right. <laughs> Another baby yeah. in your arms. Right. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. It's been so nice to talk to you again. Um, every time I talk to you, I, I get, you know, I feel like I get so much from it. So thank you again. Well, thank you. And you're welcome. Yeah. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode over at fertilityfriday.com slash 275. I hope that you enjoyed my interview with Catherine. It was such a treat to be able to chat with her. I really enjoy the reality series sessions. It always gives me an opportunity to spend a little extra one-on-one time with the clients in the different programs that I have. And I always say that it gives me a different window into their story because when we're in sessions, of course I get all of the details that are required within the intake forms and the questions that we go through in our sessions and all the information to ensure that everyone's comfortable with the method and you know everyone's questions are answered but it's different when I'm in an interview setting and I have the opportunity to just ask my guest to share her story and just kind of sit back and listen to how everything unfolded and I find that whenever I have the opportunity to do this in an interview I just discover so much more and I think maybe it just adds more texture to the story. So I have a general understanding of everything that took place and the general events, but to really go through and sit back and just listen to the stories, I think it's one of my favorite parts about doing these reality series episodes. And one of the things that I find just, this is my little microcosm. You know, I'm constantly (laughs) having conversations with women about their cycles and learning about how they've managed various issues with their menstrual cycles, with period pain, how they've managed their fertility over the years, the different challenges that they've had with medical professionals. And so in my little microcosm, there's certain things that I hear so regularly in relation to hormonal birth control and how it's prescribed for basically everything under the sun related to the menstrual cycle and how so many pretty serious (laughs) issues with menstrual cycle health are just brushed under the rug and kind of not really taken that seriously. And it's just such a consistent experience for me. So when you hear my passion and my drive and just my genuine desire to bring this information out into the light and to provide a space for women to share their stories, it really comes from years and years and years of hearing these types of stories from women And it's just completely infuriating (laughs) to know that this is basically like the current state of healthcare. So I truly hope that by sharing these uh, stories in such a public way, that over time, our systems will change. Ultimately, if we sit around and wait for someone to change the health system, we'll be waiting for a long time. But hopefully by just putting this information into the light and really validating, like listening to, honoring, and validating women's experiences, our real experiences and our own voices. I just feel like there's there's a lot of power in that and it really needs to happen more 
because so many of the women I've spoken to have tried to share their experiences and their stories and have just been dismissed (laughs) time and time again. And so, yeah, that's what I hope to create with these episodes. And that's why I continue to do this series. That's why I continue to do my pill reality series every now and then I just throw in some more episodes in the series. And so for those of you who are new to the podcast, maybe this is the first installment of the fertility awareness reality series that you've heard, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash fam reality. So F A M reality. And there's, I'm not sure exactly how many episodes I'd have to go count, but there's certainly over 20 (laughs) episodes in this series where it's an on-air client session you're getting a window into what a session with me is like and what my clients experience in our program so it, it really gives you a nice window into what's happening but also a window into real women's stories and what we're the fears that we have around coming off of birth control the the potentially negative and or positive experiences that we've had with hormonal contraceptives windows into experiences of women who've never been on hormonal contraceptives. So there's a lot of different stories and experiences that are represented in those episodes. And also along the same lines, if you haven't listened to the episodes in the pill reality series, you can head over to fertilityfriday.com slash pill reality. And in that particular series, it's not just about the pill, Several of the early episodes were specifically focused on the birth control pill, but I've since expanded and moved on to the IUD, both hormonal and non-hormonal, the implant, basically, you know, the shot, basically all the different methods of hormonal birth control. Those episodes, again, are just along the same lines of providing a space for women to share our experiences, our stories, uh, so that we can be heard and honored and validated, and so that for all the listeners so for you as a listener if you've experienced something like that for you to know that you're not alone like this is not something that only some women experience not something that's rare Uh, it's something that hundreds of thousands if not millions of women are experiencing on a regular basis and so we need to start calling that out and putting it out there now wherever you are on your fertility awareness journey whether you're just starting out you've just discovered fertility awareness and you're wanting some additional support so that you can make this a reality in your life whether you've been Googling and looking for as much information online as you possibly can, but you just want to have basically, you just want to speed up this process. It can be really confusing to be kind of going around trying to find information, finding all kinds of conflicting information and not really sure where to turn. And so if that's you, or if you have some charting experience under your belt, but you've never really felt that confident using the method for birth control, I want to personally invite you to join us in Fertility Awareness Mastery. So this is my 10 week group coaching program. We are starting in a few weeks. We're starting at the beginning of October, October 1st. And we are basically taking you through Fertility Awareness A to Z. But a big part of the program is connecting you to your fifth vital sign. So really helping you to identify the connection between your menstrual cycle and your overall health. And so for more information, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group program. Make sure to jump in and reserve your spot as we will be starting shortly. And I do anticipate that the program will sell out. So if you're wanting to join us, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group program. Now, with that said, I want to thank you for taking some time out of your day to join us and listen to the show to support the show. I appreciate all of you for sharing the show with your friends. I see all of you tagging your friends in on social media and sharing particular episodes with your friends. If you know someone who could benefit from today's episode, the link to share today's episode is fertilityfriday.com slash 274. And so thank you once again for being here with us today, for spending some time with us. And of course, as always, Until next time, be well and happy charting.